Welcome everyone, as you are joining the room. Um, we're going to start the webinar in uh, some five minutes while everybody comes in. Um, so while you enter the room, maybe you want to get familiar with that screen where we are going to have the webinar. Um, you will see that in the control, uh, you have mainly the possibility to ask questions and answers. This is something you should use if you want to uh, direct some uh, question to the speakers, which will be taken afterwards in the debate. And you can also uh, see in the chat that we will be publishing uh, some information and interesting, uh, yeah, interesting links and stuff like this. So the, the whole conversation will be in English, uh, but for the Spanish speakers, uh, they can choose to hear it in, in Spanish. Uh, one thing is that um, maybe uh, some of you have been um, participating in webinars before, and uh, we decided um, not to share during the, during the, the speakers' uh, interventions, not to be sharing many links, um, and we we thought that it would be better that at, at the end of the of the webinar we'll be sending you some bibliography um, which we find interesting and related to the webinar, so that you don't have to be so attentive to the chat, which uh, from our experience sometimes it's a bit distracting. So so yes. Um, afterwards, during after the webinar, we will be sending you. Uh, both uh, the webinar in video, a link to the video, and also uh, a link to the um, uh, to the graphic facilitation that you will be seeing. That there is someone who is, uh, um, in fact, Martin Tornola, an, art an artist. He's going to be doing the visual facilitation during the whole event. So um, I think that we are uh, ready to start. So. Now I will be um, leaving the floor uh, to Chiara Bodini, who is going to be the facilitator for this uh, webinar. So uh, welcome, uh, Chiara, I leave it to you. Thank you, Oriol. Thank you, everyone. Uh, my name is Chiara Bodini. I am a medical doctor from Italy, uh, based in Bologna, and I am um, part of the People's Health Movement and I also collaborate with the Belgian NGO Viva Salud. And my role this evening is to facilitate this webinar um, that is dedicated to the subject of healthcare privatization and the impact it had on, and it still has on uh, our health, particularly in this uh, crisis caused by the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Um, it's a pleasure for me to, to be in this role. And um, the webinar has been organized as part of a process um, which is called Health Rights in Action, which is based in Barcelona and is linked uh, to the People's Health Movement um, in the sense that the aim of the process is to support and strengthen movements that uh, fight against the privatization and the commercialization of health and, uh, and fight for uh, public health, public health care, and universal access to health. Uh, uh, so, so as part of this process, a link has been made with some uh, European and also international networks and movements that deal with health right, and particularly, as I mentioned, the People's Health Movement Europe, and then the European Network Against the Commercialization of Health um, and Social Protection. Uh, both these networks have been very active in uh, the past years to animate uh, the struggle for the right to health, both in countries and also at the European level. And uh, it is also co-organized by Public Services International, which is a federation of uh, trade unions, of public services trade unions. So uh, I, I highlight this is not rhetoric, but uh, since the webinar is part of a mobilization process, it is also good to, to see and to show um, the different actors that have come into play to make it possible. Um, and then I think it is important to uh, introduce the speakers of this webinar. 
we have four uh, excellent speakers. We have chosen them uh, because they are representative of uh, countries where the epidemic uh, hit particularly hard. Uh, we chose them because they are persons that are able to give us a double perspective, so on their, on their country, but also they are all also related to European uh, networks and movements, and also um, uh, because they are activists. Mm? So they are not just uh, capable of analyzing the situation, but also of giving a critical perspective, and many of them also have a, a first-hand, uh, hands-on experience about the things they will speak about. So uh, I will start with uh, Vittorio Agnoletto. He's a medical doctor. Uh, he's based in Milan. He's actually a professor at the University of Milan and he's activist in a, an association which is called Medicina Democratica, Democratic Medicine. He's also been a member of the European Parliament. Uh, then we have Manuel Galignanes. Uh, he's a doctor and he's a member of Maria Blanca in Barcelona. Maria Blanca, probably many of you know, but he's a very uh, large um, health movement in Spain. Um, then we have Veronique Lorsch. She's a nurse, she's a trade unionist um, from the Belgian Trade Union of Public Services, and she's also a member of the European Network Against the Commercialization of Health. And finally, we have Lucas Cartiello, who's officer for health and social protection at the European PSI, Public Services Union, EPSU. Um, the way we will conduct this webinar is in the form of an interview. So I will be asking some questions uh, to the speakers, uh, both on, on their uh, country situation and on the European situation. Um, I think it will become clear from their words, so I don't have to actually anticipate more, uh, much more about this, but um, it will be clear and we will try through, through their experience and through their analysis to highlight uh, if and what are the links between some processes that we have been witnessing in many countries and, and also in these three countries that we'll be talking about, so Belgium, Italy and Spain, about the progressive um, erosion and dismantling of public health care uh, in the forms of uh, privatization happening at different levels. Um, so this, this progressive weakening of, uh, of health and of the right to health and this increased um, commercialization, so health seen as a commodity, as something that, uh, you know, according to how much you can afford, then you can better or worse protect your health. So how did this process, uh, how are they related with the weaknesses of the response to the COVID-19 uh, epidemic that unfortunately we have seen uh, so, so badly. I mean, Italy really, and uh, Vittorio, I'm sure he will be much more evocative than me in conveying the tragedy that has, that has unfolded uh, in, in particularly in Lombardia, in Northern Italy. So what are these, these links? Uh, uh, both looking at the health of people, the more fragile groups, so the elderly in our retirement homes, and also looking at the health of workers, so the issue of, of health workers, health and, and safety. Um, I think uh, I will stop here uh, with my introduction and really leave the world to, to, to the speakers. Um, so the first, uh, the first speaker will be Vittorio. I will uh, ask Vittorio to uh, first give us an overview of how he sees uh, he, he's, Vittorio has been really monitoring uh, on a daily basis what was happening in, uh, uh, in the population, in, in the hospitals and in the retirement halls, especially in, 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 in Lombardia, in, in Milan and, and Lombardia, um, from a very close, uh, close perspective to, to, to the tragedy that was hitting people. So Vittorio, can you, can you share us, I mean, your views about, has, has the privatization that, had, that happened in the Italian healthcare system how did it impact um, what you have been witnessing in terms of uh, lack of response, of integrated response, of effective response to the epidemic? Yeah. Thank you for uh, your presentation. Uh, good evening, uh, everybody. Uh, yes, I, have, uh, I am the scientific responsible of the coronavirus uh, uh, observatory that uh, we built uh, in uh, Milan 
with uh, some uh, association, uh, Medicina Democratica, and uh, also a, a radio podcast that is a 37 and 2, that is the title of the transmission about health uh, that uh, there is uh, every weekend uh, I am uh, the speaker of this uh, transmission. Uh, so in, with the coronavirus uh, observatory, we can uh, monitor uh, day after day all the situation in uh, Lombardy and more or less also in uh, Italy. I begin with uh, one uh, thought. In uh, a globalized world, it was not difficult to predict that coronavirus would also arrive in Italy and in Lombardy the region most inserted in international routes. There was a window of opportunity. That is the term used by WHO between the discovery of the virus in China and the, its appearance in the West. The window of opportunity was a formidable opportunity to better organize the response by avoiding finding ourselves unprepared. Instead, nobody happened in Lombardy and nobody happened in Italy. The problem is this. So we have a health system focused only on care and profit, which has transformed health into a commodity, which ignores prevention because it doesn't produce profits for the private lobbies of the sector, and which does not involve the population in the protection of their individual and collective health, show this uh, is uh, Achilles heel in front of a new infectious disease of easy transmission. These uh, deficits are uh, not random and not limited only coronavirus affair. Today in Lombardy, there is the possibility to be cured with the best therapy available in the world, of being operated by teams with top level professionalism. Also, the portfolio often makes the difference. But the prevention services are reduced a minimum. First aid, almost all are in highly critical condition. General practitioners are in a short supply. Territorial clinics are reduced in a number month after month. These choices are before the private health structure are inside the public service. There is an agreement. Until now, the 40% of the public regional money for the health, the 30% is for private sector. And private sector is not interested on first aid, is not interested on emergency department, is not interested on infectious disease department because the private sector is looking for more profitable sector of the medicine. This is the first problem. But the second our problem was that the political leadership of our region uh, uh, organized the public health system in the same way of the private health system. So they destroyed, uh, they, uh, left alone completely all the prevention department. For example, we now we are in the second phase. It would be very important to have a public service to control the situation in the workplace because the workplace, the workplace reopen again completely. But our health public service about workplace doesn't ex they don't exist or they have only few few people so they are not able to control anything uh, the uh, leadership of the region don't organize didn't organize anything also about the instrument of protection for example our medical uh, um, doctor 
work for more than two weeks without any protection. And the result was that is that now we have hundreds and hundreds of medical doctors in public services that they are ill, they, uh, are, they have uh, um, uh, coronavirus, COVID-19, and this is uh, not normal. Uh, the uh, leadership of a region didn't organize anything about, about the, good line, the guideline of WHO about the protection, about the prevention. And another problem is that in Lombardy practically don't exist any epidemiological study. And the leadership of the region was not able to use the test to look for virus. So they use this test without any specific scientific strategy. They use only for symptomatic people. They don't use this test to look for the contact, the people who, uh, uh, was a ne who were near the people with a positive situation. And uh, so uh, the, uh, the virus didn't uh, uh, arrive in contact with any obstacle in his action. Uh, the result is that we have had thousands and thousands of people in the hospital. But when these people are arrive in the hospital, because the first line was not working well for the choice of a political level, so a lot of people arrive in the hospital. But we had no enough place in the emergency department. And our doctor ha uh, have had to decide which person they can cure, the, which person they can try to save, and uh, which other person was uh, abandoned completely by uh, the, the, the doctor, because there was not enough uh, health machine to uh, cure this uh, person. Uh, another dramatic uh, uh, situation was that the, the medical doctor on the territory uh, were not able to visit the people because they haven't a mask. So they visit the people only by phone. And uh, it's clear that it is not uh, the same things. So uh, now uh, we have the uh, half uh, of the number of the people who died in Italy. The people died in Italy until now is about 32,000 people. 16,000 people died in Lombardy. Lombardy has a population about 10 million of persons. Uh, so the first reason is privatization. The second reason is the a, a way to organize the public system in the same way of a private, a private sector. And the third idea that is very important for the future is that uh, in Lombardy, the health system is uh, practically only about the cure. I know that we are the first in uh, uh, Italy, uh, probably one of the first regions in, in uh, Europe uh, uh, for the cure, for the surgeon intervention, for uh, a, a special trial, but only for this. And now there is a, a, a center, a, a very, very scientific, very, very important scientific center in Milan for the study about genoma. But in the same time, the people who uh, are looking for uh, a, 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 a visit or uh, for a, a little surgery intervention must wait month, month, and month. Uh, because is, uh, this is not important for the profit, for profit. And the situation became absolutely uh, dramatic, not only in Milan, but everywhere. I stop here. I think it's uh, enough of with, uh, my time. Thank you, Vittorio. Yes, uh, thank you for sharing this. It, is, uh, it was very clear. So a combination of, uh, uh, I mean, structural, uh, uh, weakening of, of, of the system, also deliberate choices of the political leadership in orienting uh, the healthcare system towards cure, 
and neglecting or eroding or dismantling the primary, the primary level services. I just want to add that despite uh, Emilia Romagna, the, the region I'm from, is uh, the, the opposite, uh, you know, it's a bit the opposite model. So it's, it's claimed as the, the region has gone more to the public and strengthening uh, the, 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 the national health, the regional healthcare services. Nevertheless, some of the structural uh, weaknesses that Victoria pointed out, and namely the lack of um, uh, people, I mean, concrete resources, pe people, bodies, <laughs> brains in the public health departments has been also a serious, serious challenge uh, and even affecting the, the second phase. So we, we see that our system has lost the capacity to prevent and to be close to the people to 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 organize the very first line of protection uh, and i think this is this is widespread uh, throughout the country okay i will now ask to uh, manuel um, to comment on on the same aspect so what what happened in spain and uh, uh, was it different was it similar to the, to to what victoria described in terms of uh, a, a, a malfunctioning uh, healthcare system in some areas, which which was deliberately, uh, you know, shaped in this way, and impact on uh, the response that has been or, or hasn't been organized to address the the epidemic. Manuel. Yeah. Thank you, Chiara. Um, well, the, the, the experience in Spain is very similar to the one described by Vittorio. Um, I, I will start giving you some background of how. The National Health Service evolved from the last 30 years in Spain. Uh, in 1986, the General Health Law was approved establishing a new framework for healthcare. This law allowed, in other aspects, the implementation of the primary care model that we have today. The political pressure, though, uh, left the door open for private companies to do business at the expense of the National Health Service. For example, Article 90 from this law allowed the referral of activity to private hospitals, provided that the public hospitals have previously optimized their resources. During the last three decades, cuts and closings have occurred in public hospitals, and while complex treatments were carried out in public hospitals, the easy and economically profitable treatments and tests were transferred to private ones under the so-called concerts. This has been the keynote in the entire state, regardless of, the, of who governs. All politicians have used it, demonstrating that connections between public managers and private healthcare. The result is that around 8,000 million euros are directed to private pockets through concerts every year. But they are great territorial variations. For example, in Catalonia, 25% of the health budget goes to the private sector, while at the state level, it is around 12%. It is um, uh, very interesting that just five years after the approval of the general health law, on having barely allowed to develop the contents of primary care, the socialist party, the known PSOE launched the so-called April report with the support aim to modernize health. The recommendation of this report were clear. The health system must function as a private company and as such the criteria of efficiency and savings had to be applied. These recommendations drawn up by experts, some of whom were related to the pharmaceutical industry, were soon implemented. Still, the general health law constrained the private sector and therefore it was necessary to modify it. For this, a new law uh, prepared in 1997, which allowed the, uh, any health or social health center in Spain to be managed and operated by companies with profit motivation. I have to say though that uh, the penetration of, that, of the private sector was very different in the various uh, Spanish autonomic regions. Catalonia, for instance, the region from where I come from, had already developed its own model, mostly in private hands. From this point, everything was much easier for the private sector, with the right party, Pepe, in government, the nationalist opening ground, and the PSOE allowing to do so, 
a process of deterioration was accelerated with even more closures of public centers, which were replaced by the so-called pub public-private collaboration. Of course, uh, the collaboration consisted in, the, uh, in that the public money was the benefit of the private sector. The added problem was that some of these centers were awarded for the case to venture capitals, construction companies, or banks. This kind of activity has left a trail of extra costs and corruptions and a reduction in the capacity of public health centers. And as a result, we have seen a reduction of the budget directed to the centers with pure public management, a planned decline in primary care, a dramatic increase in surgical and diagnostic waiting list to unknown limits, an exponential growth of private insurance, and a continuous change of hands of shares of the private uh, privatized hospitals. It was clear that any increase in the needs of care of the population was going to cause the collapse and the lack of response from the health system, and it has been evidenced by the COVID crisis. Now, regarding the COVID uh, pandemic, um, which is very similar to Italy, um, the number of infected people, only those diagnosed by PCR, is of more than 231,000 since the beginning of the pandemic, with almost two, two, uh, 28,000 fatalities. We, we have the highest figures of fatalities in the world per, per million population. In Spain, uh, Spain leads the world ranking in this respect. And I, here I'm going to give you some figures. In Spain, um, there are 594 fatalities, fatalities per million population. Whereas in Portugal, which is a, a neighbor country, identical people, similar uh, lifestyle, um, the, the uh, mortality was 102 per 1 million population, which means six times more in Spain than in Portugal. Germany, for instance, got even less, 81 fatalities per million uh, people. And uh, in contrast, Cuba, a uh, socialist um, country, and uh, possibly mm, economically not as high as um, other countries in Europe, but very well developed primary care uh, in, in this country. They got six, only six fatalities per million inhabitants, the, the best in the world. Well, um, the healthcare professionals have also been affected very badly, as Victoria was already mentioning. Um, the almost 44,000 healthcare professionals, that is 20% of the workforce, that have been infected by the virus. So in summary, the public health system in Spain is down, while private healthcare is blooming. And arriving at this point, the question is, can we keep the healthcare system out of business? and profit and to build a universal, a, universal, a universal healthcare system. Certainly we don't expect anything from politicians, whether from the right or from the left. It's my belief that if we want to defend the public healthcare system and reverse its privatization, the, the citizens should organize themselves through social movements or whatever way. It is very important that uh, the laws that have turned the healthcare into a bazaar and repeal and the public health system is shielded so that no one a euro of our taxes can ever go to private pockets. My other question is, can we organize ourselves at the European level and be able to produce a law to back up the public health system, a law that have to be presented and defended in Brussels? Dear friends, there are no other ways. And I finish here. Thank you very much, uh, Manuel. Uh, very clear from uh, your presentation. Um, I, I would like to highlight how you, you pointed out that uh, it was not really a matter of uh, political parties. And, and I think we have the same in, in many countries. So it's not like the so-called left 
has acted very differently uh, in terms of pushing for a more or less explicit um, privatization of, uh, of healthcare. Um, and also how you highlighted how the, the links between public management and private management and private profit are, clo are, are very close, are very tight. Uh, and, and also pointing that what we call private is actually subsidized, as, as Vittorio also pointed out, heavily subsidized by, by public money. So it is our money that is going to, to, boost, uh, to boost that profit instead of our health. Um, also, I think you highlighted very well primary health care, again, as, as the front line that's been, uh, uh, that's been really weakened and that we, we were seeing the, the, the bad consequences of this. And finally, also calling for uh, movements and resistance. And this is very important for us as we are here also to strengthen this kind of connections. And, and luckily, we do have some networks that need to be even more strengthened. Um, we're now focusing a bit more on what happened in retirement homes, uh, and it, it is really a, it is really a tragedy uh, that, that speaks not just about the virus, that speaks about, uh, I think, a much deeper problem in our society that is now violently exposed by what has happened. Um, so all the, all, in all our countries, we have seen a high percentage of deaths happening in retirement homes for the elderly. Um, so I will get back now to, to Manuel to, to comment on how he sees what has happened in Spain uh, in, in this particular area of, uh, of health, what should be health protection that has become actually an area of, of high contagion and death. Okay, I, I will be very brief. It's a complete disaster in here. Uh, in Spain, there are approximately 5,400 uh, Spanish uh, nursing homes. Uh, of these, um, 3,800 uh, are private and uh, 5,500 are public. This make for a total of around 3,373,000 uh, beds with more than, um, let me see the figures, 270,000 private beds. That is almost two thirds of the nursing homes are beds in private hands. So imagine what is the result. Uh, these nursing homes are run without any type of control. And the consequences of uh, all this is very high death toll recorded in nursing homes during the COVID pandemic. Uh, the latest figures are that more than 19,000 elderly people have been killed by COVID in Spain, with, uh, which represents 71% uh, of the total officially notified deaths. Uh, interestingly, most of the deaths have occurred in four autonomic communities, Catalonia, Madrid, Castilla y León, and Castilla-La Mancha. Uh, the 71% mortality that I quote in, in, in Spain contrasts with 50% in Italy, your country, 35% in South Korea, uh, or 40% in China. It is really disturbing that the army had found deceased elderly people living with other residents in these centers. And because of this, the state attorney general office maintained more than 200 civil and 150 criminal proceedings in relation with the uh, uh, management of the COVID crisis in residencies. As with the healthcare system, we need to re revert uh, uh, residencies to the public sector implementing the necessary changes in their management and healthcare. Um, this is a terrible, terrible problem that we need to solve with uh, urgency. Um, so I, I finish here, I, I being quite brief. Thank you, Manuel. I, th I think actually the numbers speak, uh, speak very well and, and very harshly as well. Uh, Vittorio, now on to you on a not, not better situation actually in, in our country. Vittorio, il microfono. Ok. Ok. You sì. listen to me? Sì, 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 sì. Perfect. All right. So, I, I, before I would like to give you uh, some uh, numbers, some date, so we, you can uh, confront with the date of uh, Manuel. For example, uh, in uh, Lombardy, we have had one hundred 
60 dead every 100,000 people. That means 1,600 dead people every 1 million is in Lombardy. A number number uh, is about uh, uh, the beds, the hospital beds, the place hospital beds. In uh, 1981, immediately after our health reform for a universal system, we had 530,000 beds in the hospital. In, 2000, in 2017, so three years ago, we had only 230,000, so less than half beds in hospital. And this was one of the, uh, the, the chaos uh, of a disaster. Uh, another news that I think that could be important is that uh, now in Lombardy, practically you can go for uh, pharyngeal swab only in private laboratory. The health public system organized pharyngeal swab only for the people in a system, symptomatological situation in hospital. If you are not symptomatic, if you are in contact of the people with uh, COVID, if you have had COVID before, and now you must go to work, you must pay by yourself the pharyngeal swab. And also the research of the antibodies, you must pay by yourself. So it's a big profit for all the private laboratory. We, had, uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, retired home with thousands and thousands of people inside. You must think that the mid-age of the people died in Italy is about 79, 80 years old. So uh, these uh, people is in a very, very dangerous situation. The 8th of March, the government of Lombardy take a terrible decision, terrible decision. Ask to retired home to host COVID people with infections that were, uh, who were going out of the hospital because in the hospital there were no enough places. So after the more dramatic situation, the COVID people can go out of the hospital, but out of the emergency department, but not inside the other hospital, but inside retired home. The retired home were full of a lot of older people. So it was a tragedy, a tragedy, because a lot of these people became infected and they died inside this home. And there was no relationship between, the, between this home and the people outside, between the people inside and, and the family people outside. They can speak only sometime with the telephone and that the people haven't had any news about uh, the family people inside this uh, home. Not only. The uh, uh, health people who was inside this uh, uh, re uh, retired home have uh, had no enough uh, mask, no e enough uh, protection instrument. So a lot of, of these uh, health uh, people became ill and uh, there was a, a lot of denounce and uh, now the judge are working to look for, re, uh, for uh, responsibility. And uh, the, because, uh, the, the reason was also because uh, in uh, the years before, the region didn't want to build a special hospital like intermediary situation, not for acute uh, situation of ill. And uh, so they, the, the region uh, didn't know where put these people that had to go outside the hospital. Uh, in uh, Bergamo, that one of the town in Lombardy, uh, there was uh, for uh, some weeks 
10, 10, and 10, and 10. Uh, uh, I don't know the name in English, uh, the, the, the place with, with the tomb, the tomb for the older people with the camion uh, full of the body of the people died. And uh, the family people cannot participate to the funeral of, his, uh, of their family died. It was a really, really a, a, a tragedy. But on the other side, the owner of the retired home are uh, private because there is a, an agreement between the owner and, and the public system. But the, the, the owner are private. And so they were very, very happy to receive people with COVID because uh, the public instructor, because the region pay a lot, a lot of money for every night of a COVID person inside hospitalization. Oh, okay, the I finish here. All right, is my time? Okay, okay. Because I listen a, a, a word, was finished the time? I, I, I don't know, Vittorio, I also heard an uh, interruption. Uh, so you, you can finish your sentence if you ah, want. Okay, so I, I said that, that this, uh, I, I explained that this was a uh, uh, really a uh, tragedy. And uh, uh, we count uh, a lot of thousand people died inside this uh, structure. On the other, other side, there was another important situation. Uh, the region tried to hide the number of the older people died. So when the medical doctor called uh, to the public number to say, I have a, a person about 18, about 70, that uh, is ill. We need uh, to go to the hospital. The uh, public system said, no, it's not a necessary hospital. So a lot of older people died in his uh, home and there was no diagnosis about COVID. Formally, they died for a, a, a other reason. So we think that the number of the died people inside uh, Lombardy for the COVID is more, is probably twice than 16,000 people. You must think that now about 10 million of people, probably in Lombardy, we have between, uh, among 500,000 people to 1 million in the middle uh, COVID positive person. This is uh, our uh, situation now. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Vittorio. Um, I am just a bit concerned with time, so I will not make my remarks now and save it for the for later. And I would like now to give the word to Veronique. I already introduced her. Um, she has both a Belgian and a European perspective. So, but first, I would like to ask her to 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 give us uh, her view about the situation in Belgium, uh, how it relates again to what we heard in the other countries, how it is specific, and what what is happening now. Okay. So <clears throat> we started in Belgium with a, a problem. We didn't have a government. So we had to decide very quite fast to have a new government, an emergency one, okay, to respond also to this epidemic. Um, you have to know that in Belgium, um, there are no private hospital as in Spain or in Italy. Also, you have sort of private structure who are non-profit. And um, the public hospitals are organized by the cities and the private hospitals, uh, um, they, they are usually are organized by doctors and the way to finance them is a little bit different, but all the money comes from public money, our money, as you said before. So when the COVID-19 uh, struck, they have to decide it very fast how to react. They put all the hospitals on an emergency plan. All the hospitals had to empty the wards, cancel all the operations, were not, uh, not an emergency, and prepare themselves to receive all these uh, new potential um, COVID patient. They were afraid to be overwhelmed like 
Italy, uh, and um, they tried to prevent that, and they, I think they did, they did succeed in preventing to be overwhelmed by all the patients, although that we were at certain moments on the verge of the limit of intensive care beds, and there was a lot of um, a lot of um, concern in the public because um, they decided to keep the, all the people who were in um, retirement homes. So the people who were there uh, were close to the family. They did not receive any visits anymore. They wanted to prevent uh, contamination to this um, fragile public, but they did not. Um, they did not succeed in it because, uh, in certain retirement homes, and I think they were the private ones mainly. You had outbreaks of COVID nineteen. There was one home in Brussels who was struck with thirteen people who died within days in the beginning of the, of the epidemic. Um, we discovered also that the people, the nursing assistants who worked in these places were not, didn't have um, protection. They didn't have masks, they didn't have cones, they didn't have enough gloves. So without knowing, they were probably contaminating the residents who were not sick, who were not yet sick. So in Belgium, the, 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 the retirement or nursing homes are still, 40% of them are still in public hands and the rest is in the hands of a smaller nonprofit organization and a still growing part is in hands of big corporations like Harmonia or Corian or other ones who try to get money out of these elderly people. And uh, the market has been expanding since the need of these homes has been rising because the population gets older like everywhere here in Europe. And because the beds are limited in Belgium by the public uh, authority. The pressure was um, was um, was strong on these places. So um, they didn't put the the retirement home in this emergency plan. They didn't give anything. They didn't have um, the systems to detect people who were uh, sick, who, who were um, at risk. So uh, I think we lost a lot of time in these retirement homes. Um, for the hospitals, uh, when uh, we were on the verge of having all the intensive care beds being filled, there was a plan between the hospitals to transfer the, pa the patients from one place to the other in case it would be too full in one place, like they did in France. But because Belgium is smaller, it's easier. Uh, all the, he the healthcare staff, staff in all the hospitals were moved from one place to the other. Within days, the people had to change the way they had to work, they had to move to other places, meet new colleagues. The same happened to doctors. For now, the situation is calming down in Belgium. Uh, we have less and less infections. The hospitals are slowly trying to get back to a, a more normal business, but it's still not possible. Uh, because uh, of the um, rules of protection and of distanciation, they cannot have all the patients in one. So uh, the, um, 
the activity of all the hospitals has been uh, slowing down by like 30, 35%. But if the activity is slowing down, this will be a very big problem for the hospital because there is no money coming in. Because they are, uh, they are, they, they need this money um, that is generated through the activity of the doctors to generate money to make the to 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 let run the hospital, and all this money is not coming not not coming in. So, um, for example, one of uh, the hospitals, the public hospitals in Brussels, has been showing as the numbers and like um, usually they generate uh, 300 million in a year and they know already that they have a gap of about 50 to 60 millions. Do we have time? More? Sorry to, to, yes? to interrupt. Uh, um, can I ask you the second question? Is there some, something again uh, yes. more important that you want to say? Okay. Uh, because we're a bit out of time, maybe we can yes. get back on the questions and answers. Um, so thanks for sharing all this uh, um, about Belgium. And since you're also part of the European uh, network against the commercialization of healthcare, uh, can you also, in, in a very few minutes, we, we know it's, it's uh, yes. limited, but uh, give us just an overview about the situation in Europe. In Europe? Okay, I will focus on the attitude of the European community, okay? Since years and years, the European community has been putting a strong pressure on all the European countries to uh, lessen public expenditure. So they have uh, obeyed to these injunctions and have been uh, lessening the, the funds they are giving towards healthcare. But because of uh, the pressure on healthcare, the, um, the budgets are not raising anymore. So my, my, um, my main reaction to what happened is also that the European community was not very reactive um, to what happened in, the, in uh, the countries who really needed help, like Italy and Spain. They, there was a sort of lack in, of reaction. Uh, it should have been much faster. And the solidarity who, who should have been expected, maybe funds who should have been given um, much sooner into the epidemic have been slow to arrive. But uh, for me, the future is more important because um, I think that the EU has to be pushing the countries to more solidarity, but I, I don't know how they will uh, do it. And um, they have been constructed a new a European Union on an economic basis. And uh, what we lack is the social basis. Um, also, um, they still use a sort of way with the European countries of on one way, they give uh, financial injunctions and then on the other way, they give injunctions on the structures the countries has to follow or the nursing staffing, they just give to Belgium um, uh, injunction they said, you have to raise the nursing staffing, but how can we do it if we don't have enough money to finance this staffing? So I, the, I think that the countries who best resisted to uh, the, the epidem epidemic were the ones who had uh, a still a, a strong publicly organized healthcare and, um, and uh, I think this is the way we have to follow to push the European agenda to help the countries to achieve this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Veronique, for uh, in a very short time for giving us also a direction 
of where our, our struggles at the European level may uh, try to aim at. So we will now, uh, we now have our final uh, speaker, Lucas Cartiello, to give us uh, a perspective, a trade union perspective on workers and health workers. What happened to them in this period? And, uh, uh, you know, I mean, what, what are the key issues that also they are facing in this time and will be facing in the near future? Luca. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks, Chiara. I think, well, uh, good, uh, good evening uh, to everyone. Well, I think that one of the good things of being the last one is that you can avoid of repeating a number of elements and figures. Uh, and uh, maybe I can uh, answer, I can uh, try to articulate a number of uh, elements also that are connected to this, but also in particular to the issue of privatization. I think that uh, we all know actually, one, one thing I wanted to say to you in, uh, in advance is that actually one of the things that make us proud, not only me, not only the comrade from C, uh, from uh, uh, the Belgian unions, but also many of our people connected, is that uh, we in EPSU are representing not only one professional category in uh, the hospitals, and not even nor the public or the private, but we try to represent all the workers that are in one uh, in the establishments that are in hospitals that are in social services and uh, uh, i think that this gives us also a quite important and interesting uh, uh, glance uh, of the situation from this point of view uh, the situation it's clear uh, i will start with something banal that uh, actually uh, the outbreak has put has highlighted the number of problems that they were already in uh, in the hospital and i think that we cannot start for instance from one of the most uh, uh, clear examples that are actually protective material uh, we have been always saying that the situation of the healthcare workers uh, uh, was exacerbated and by exacerbating and uh, in, uh, making worse the infection of the healthcare workers, we gave a substantial contribution, not only to increasing the danger for, uh, for themselves, but also increasing the outbreak because the hospital became so what we call the super uh, springs. Uh, were the one that actually also gave, uh, together with uh, social service facilities and long-term facilities, uh, a contribution. And this happened largely for two elements uh, that are uh, uh, that we have seen uh, clearly. On one side, the lack of uh, protective material, and and I think that there are two aspects that uh, needs to be taken into consideration. The first one is that many times we say that Europe was not prepared to the outbreak, and this is true. But it is true also that we had already two pandemics in the past, the SARS and the MERS pandemic, and Europe already there took a commitment to stockpile protective material. But when this arrived, clearly there was no stockpiling. And I think one of the things that we are already asking, we will ask in future why this, is, this couldn't happen. What so sudden this ep epidemic? Why we arrived to a moment at the beginning of March where member states were competing each other? And competing on healthcare is really one of the worst things you can do during a pandemic instead of cooperating. And we couldn't have a clear, we couldn't have any stockpiling. And therefore, uh, also for the future, it is fundamental that Europe not only create a strategic stockpiling, but also in particular that clarifies procedures how to be ready for the future and also clarify why, why we didn't do for the past. One of the things that we believe is that one of the reasons why was that there were simply other priorities because 
healthcare was also in the last budget, and we know in the MFF uh, already in the last proposals before the outbreak, uh, healthcare funding, uh, funds for public healthcare were supposed to be cut by around, uh, I think something like 100 mil millions of euros, which is nothing but gives you clearly a direction. A second problem is that also for the future, we have different kind of privatization. One of the worst is also that we don't have means at the moment to create and to have clear supply chains of uh, uh, protective material in Europe. We did not have anything and we don't have yet. So we arrived to the moment where we will need, for instance, only for Italy, I've heard that we need something like 4 billion of masks every, uh, every month to supply all the different needs. And instead, we don't have the possibility yet to produce them because the supply chain is completely privatized also for this element. Second element, safety provisions, uh, which were extremely uh, which were uh, extremely not clear. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, the, the aspect of testing has not been clarified until April, and yet now one of the provisions from OMS, but also ECDC, was to test only person, those from the healthcare staff, which has been showing uh, symptoms, so disregarding completely also those that, for instance, uh, were not showing uh, uh, effect symptoms, and also in general, also those that could not afford simply to take days off. Because also at the beginning of this crisis, the classification of COVID within the hospital as occupational disease, and also something where people was encouraged instead they could not take days off to stay home, were not clear. We had a number of people that also exacerbated by the outsourcing, so the different players that in hospitals manage workforce, and that in many cases, either you are present or you don't have enough salary because maybe you have an, a precarious contract, were forced to go to work. We know now that those things were at the bulk of the pandemic. Um, and this is, a, uh, this is an element. Uh, third element that I think it's also important for our discussion is actually the lack of staffing. Uh, we have now an entire generation of, uh, we have had for the last uh, 10 years actually, I give you always the example for Greece, uh, we had a cut in the last five years uh, due to the Troika of more than 13,000 doctors and 26,000 health workers only in one country. And those are Eurostat giving those. And this is clearly that we arrived to this outbreak without the workforce we needed to provide also the public health care, the primary health care needed. So we are coming also from years of uh, disinvestment and also of cut to the workforce, substituted also in many cases by now young doctors, which, for instance, has been put uh, many times with precarious contract in our hospitals. And one of the key demands that we are asking now is to provide also to those people uh, security also for the future. Now, I think that one of the, of the element uh, I agree with Victorio is Artusa uh, too. On one side uh, that uh, we will have a lot of money coming in our systems, and we will have a lot of money arriving. How this money will be spent? Because uh, already now you see private healthcare, uh, big players like Corpea, Armonia, uh, Korean uh, in social care that are already going featuring uh, the reality of what's happening in the hospital, saying that private healthcare was key for preventing uh, the outbreak. 
But now actually the real battle starts because we, we, have, we are to a kind of, we can choose between giving money also to the private sectors to continue working on the same models that feature the semesters and so on, or we can choose, for instance, other kind of investment, investment in the basic primary healthcare, but not only, also in decentralizing healthcare. We don't have to put people all in big hospitals. We need also to invest into territorial medicines, reorganize services on the territory and do it on a public basis. We hope that we will fight and we know that, and it's good that we organize those moments because I think that those fights will need to be carried together also for the future. Thanks. Thank you very much, Luca, also for, for sticking to the time and for very effectively highlighting the areas of uh, where, where the problems were and also the areas where we should make stronger choices and pressures uh, for the coming period. Um, we're now uh, with a bit of delay, but um, I'm happy to open the debate. Uh, prior to this, I would like to give word to uh, something that was shared by um, members of the Bulgarian trade union, nurses trade union, uh, which uh, have uh, in these days uh, asked for international solidarity for their struggle. Um, they're sharing that even though the COVID-19 epidemic wasn't so bad in Bulgaria, that the conditions of healthcare and the conditions of health workers is particularly problematic. Uh, that the system in Bulgaria has been commercialized, so all the hospitals are commercial societies and they have to generate profit. And the wages of the staff is based on uh, the, the number of patients treated. And so it's based on the, 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 the economic activity that the hospital is able to, to generate. Um, this condition, of course, uh, places the health uh, of the patients and of the staff in the second place uh, compared to the economic aspect. Uh, and also in Bulgaria, as we have seen, it's actually public money that uh, subsidizes this uh, private uh, and commercial uh, system. Um, so this, this management has, uh, has uh, really um, increased the inequalities within the health sector with uh, uh, some people who be became very rich out of this, so managers and, and, and senior doctors and other workers that are paid even uh, below the average uh, wage. Um, so the nurses particularly are leading now this struggle and they have been now for more than a year they have been mobilizing and uh, they share their motto, which is health is not a commodity. It's a matter of national safety and common law. Saving lives and caring for people is our goal and not profits. Um, so this is, uh, this is actually a call you will see. We will then circulate also the link uh, uh, for, for supporting and, and making, sharing in solidarity this, uh, this struggle. Um, solidarity is our purpose. That's how they end their uh, uh, their uh, statement. Um, okay, I I think I will uh, just uh, I would like to give space to the questions, so I will not make my remarks here. Um, so there is a question that was posed to Manuel, which I think is quite interesting, probably for for many, uh, which is about the news that we heard that uh, that the national the government in Spain was sort of taking action to nationalize. Uh, private hospitals. Uh, Manuel, can you, can you tell us something? Did this really happen and to what extent? Um, well, um, this, is, this is an aim, obviously, uh, during the crisis when everything is uh, um, difficult. Um, the reality, I think, is quite different. I think um, it's not going to happen, at least straight away, um, we'll see what happened. The government now is uh, every day is weaker and weaker, and I don't know how long it's going to stay in there. So that to tackle now something um, so big is at the moment. I don't think it's going to happen. Um, at the beginning of the, this crisis, um, well, the, 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 the government said, well, everything is going to be nationalized. Private hospitals are going to be um, taken and uh, and run by uh, the National Health Service. This never happened. 
And um, what we have in Catalonia is um, dreadful. And we have a law, a decree, um, a few weeks ago, um, already paying an enormous amount of money for uh, every person that uh, was uh, in ITU in private hospitals, 43,000 uh, euros per patient, which is um, outrageous. Um, uh, uh, well, I, I think this is difficult. And um, uh, I think all these um, uh, hospitals, all these consortiums and, uh, uh, are, are putting a lot of pressure on the government. And I don't think it's going to happen. We need to fight our way if we want any change. I think what we need to, to, to do is, uh, there's a lack of vision of politicians, certainly. As um, Luca was already saying, um, why we, uh, we took such a long time to take action. I think part of it was because the politicians lacked that vision, uh, but certainly to improve the system, we need to change the uh, fiscal system. I think we need to, um, uh, make sure that uh, those companies that are paying very little uh, be more involved in the uh, paying more, uh, whatever they, they have to. Um, Thank you, Emmanuel. Uh, so, sorry, I, I, uh... I, I just I finished. Yeah. I think that uh, all the expenditure in the uh, health service that shouldn't be taken as a expenditure, I think it should be taken as an investment. Thank you. That's that's very relevant. So in Spain, as we've seen in other countries, despite the claims, actually, the, the public system has ended up buying for a very high price uh, services from the private sector, not being able to actually make use of it as a public uh, facility. Um, I, I now have a question for Veronique um, about, um, I, I want to read it so I, I don't make it. Uh, so uh, how did privatization in Belgium affect the COVID response? It sounds like there was a strong response in the hospitals guided by the government, despite big financial losses. So do you see any link between privatization and the response that, that happened? Okay. Uh, for the moment, uh, I cannot see it in the hospitals. I can see it in the nursing homes, the retirement homes, because the, they were hit really, really, really strongly, strongly. Half more of half of the deaths in Belgium occurred in the nursing homes. I do not have the numbers to, to tell you if it was in more private homes or public or non-profit because uh, these are numbers you cannot find actually. But um, it will, I, I, I am afraid that there will be a financial fiasco for the hospitals have been investing as private or public hospitals in all this transformation and paying the people, sometimes people who were sent homes because they didn't have work for them. But already now they can see like last year, like a third of the hospitals in Belgium were losing money. Since years and years, they have been telling uh, to the politicians that they have to raise the, um, the money they give to the hospitals if they want them to continue as before. And um, there, were, there, there is a strong call now from the doctors, but also from the nurses. The nurses have been asking for years and years to raise the numbers. We are not enough in the words to uh, make um, a, a work of quality. And um, since uh, two weeks now, um, the government is hearing us, just hearing us. We don't know if this will get results, but they are reading, re um, hearing uh, us and uh, we hope that this will bring um, some uh, some effects in the few in the months that will come. Do you have more? Do you do you want thank me to elaborate thank more? Thank you. No, that's that's great, Veronique. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, 
another question that's imposed on panelists, but I, I would like to, uh, to put to Vittorio, uh, which is basically summarized like this. Do you think that the private sector in health should be uh, sort of removed completely, or do you think it should and could be regulated? I, I think uh, that the private sector has a, a completely different aim for the public sector about uh, health system. Uh, private and public have uh, a different mission because for the private is very important. Private health industry is like every other industry. Their aim is to have a profit a big profit. For the private sector, it's very important to have a lot of ill, a lot of illness. So it's clear. For And they are not interested in on prevention. They are not interested to avoid illness. Because if you are able to avoid a lot of listen, they lost they lose a lot of money. So it's completely different thing. My opinion is that it's necessary a public health universal system, uh, completely uh, gratis, you must not pay. Every citizen must pay at the beginning with taxes in a, 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 in a relationship with his uh, uh, profit, it's personal profit, but after nobody must pay. And uh, I think that uh, the essential level of assistance that in Italy, this means uh, the cure that every people must have, must be uh, given by public sector. Private sector can exist outside completely the health system for the people who want uh, uh, to pay to have uh, a better assistance or they want to avoid the queue and to have uh, the, the visit uh, the day after and so on. But I think it should be outside. And another suggestion is that I believe that it's time to have one, only one health system in a uh, European Union. And uh, I think we need to fight because the health must be inside the structure of European Union. Instead, until now, the uh, matter of health is completely outside. We can discuss only sometime in European Parliament about uh, pharma, but uh, without uh, taking uh, any important uh, decision. I believe that we need a European health system, a Euro public European health system. And the last one thing is that after this tragedy, because in Lombardy is really a tragedy of COVID, Medicina Democratica with a lot of, a lot of other association is organizing a national coordinator to have uh, a, a national uh, platform uh, to uh, ask uh, to change completely the organization of our uh, health system. And uh, for the uh, end of June, we are uh, uh, organizing the first, first demonstration, a uh, square demonstration outside, not web demonstration, in uh, Mailand in front of uh, the uh, regional office and uh, I think that uh, it will be possible to link uh, together people and uh, the health workers because also health workers suffered a lot of uh, about uh, this situation. Thank you very much Vittorio also for, for, for raising again the issue of the European response. I think it's uh, it's quite a shared position that we want more from Europe in terms of healthcare. I would like to ask Luca if, if he can come and he also he out, you know, to, to some actions that the European Union would have taken, uh, should have taken. 
there was one specific question saying there was such, such, such a delay also between the response in Italy and then in Spain and Belgium and would a European management of uh, uh, the, 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 the strategy to address the disease, would, would it have helped? Uh, how, how do you see it? Chiara, uh, I make always an example that uh, at the beginning of the, uh, it was a March, uh, we had already a first exchange with the commission on this and so on. Uh, we had, uh, we arrived to a situation where member states, I make always the example, we had uh, uh, Germany for a mask, we have uh, Czech Republic for ventilators and so on were banning, exporting of this material because uh, uh, actually there was no at all uh, any procedure to uh, keep uh, alive uh, provision of those sectors. So the question is uh, per se answered, of course, yes, because we have seen not only that is not effective, but we have seen also that this cost life on this. Uh, now, uh, for the future. I think that uh, it was funny because two days ago after years of cost effectiveness, increasing out of pocket money, uh, increasing uh, efficiency and so on, the European Commission started say, remind themselves that they have to invest, member states needs to invest to, um, in public health care and also in aspect like, uh, uh, for instance, primary care on uh, workforce and so on. The point now is, is that uh, there are critical aspects also on the European cooperation. Did I make you two examples and then I shut up? The first one is the fact that the ECDC, the EMA and so on today do not, do not represent a clear coordination body of the healthcare systems. And this is a matter of fact. ECDC about all this crisis did not understand anything till the mid of March. And this is a matter of fact. And they are our ECDC. In this way, EMA on the vaccine is completely in the private healthcare, in the private hand the uh, development of vaccine uh, provisions and so on. We do not have on this any co coordination and you have a revenge, Sanofi, which comes a private uh, French uh, enterprise, which comes and say, unless you don't invest in our company, you don't get the vaccine. I think that this is clear that we need an healthcare union, but again, we need to fight in order to have some a cooperation which starts, for instance, from coordinating the response, trying to harmonize different models, trying to arrive to, for instance, the issue of the stress test for the healthcare systems and trying to incorporate this uh, to the coordination that we have. We don't need actually Europe to dictate us uh, to make more privatization than before. Yeah, thank you, Luca. Very, very clear. So we, we don't need a, we don't need a European Union intervention if it is not in the interest of the people. So in other way, there's a power balance that we need to address. Otherwise, the the institutions that come into place will only, I mean, reinforce the, the preference uh, uh, towards uh, profit and not people. So just we have a very, I mean, two minutes for a final round which I would like to, to, to be action oriented. So Luca, come back again, please. What, what can we expect from workers struggle? Is there, is there anything promising coming from, from this but, uh, area uh, of struggle? I would like to be more precise, but we are actually in discussion, but I think that already from, the, from what I'm hearing around and um, honestly being in this space, uh, trade union is an exciting, no, I don't want to use exciting, but I've used a moment because for the first time, actually, you find this element of solidarity in all the systems, actually, which comes after an, what economists call a symmetric shock. And this is, of course, creating also a link of solidarity, mutually reinforcing. I think that number one priority is that that applauses will not be enough. Uh, we don't, we need actually to have uh, uh, systems uh, and we want to have salary compensation, uh, 
Uh, I think already Belgium is already self-evident example that uh, applauses will not be enough. We need to fight, we need to fight for salary because worker needs to be recognized, but we need also to find, uh, to fight to, in, to increase uh, safety and health in our hospitals, because uh, this is fundamental. Being a doctor, being a nurse, being a healthcare assistant cannot be a matter of heroes. And what happened this time, for the sake of our generation and the generation that will come doing this job cannot happen and will never happen again. Thank you, Luca. Uh, Manuel, what are the Maria, Maria Blancas, are they reacting? Is there, is there a rising again in, in health movements in Spain? What can we expect for the future? Well, um, I already um, exposed that in my previous presentations. Um, I, I think that the COVID pandemic has exposed um, our deficiencies in the welfare state and now it's necessary to undertake a reconstruction uh, to get out of, the, of this crisis. Uh, but not only for this reason, I, I think we must, as um, other colleagues have uh, pointed out, uh, public, public services uh, need to be protected, uh, strengthened and developed then, uh, and reversing the cuts in health, social services and pensions. and. Uh, uh, that uh, we have seen the, already going down during the last decades. Um, Services are, are the true pillars for the majority living conditions. So um, I think that to be successful in this endeavor, uh, we need to join forces at the European level and defend the citizens' uh, rights together. Um, w w alone, I don't think we are going to be able to. And uh, to um, have this division between countries already looking for their economy without missing the, the big picture of what Europe represents and the well-being of all Europeans, I think we are missing a, um, a, a, a good occasion to build that a common future and uh, to have uh, a nice structures for the whole society. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, Manuel. Uh, Veronique, Veronique is, the, is the European network, are they preparing any mobilization? What, what's under discussion in okay. terms of... Uh, in Europe. Okay. For the moment, uh, so on the European network, we were doing this action always in April. We're going to discuss in the future how we can continue on these uh, on these um, actions. Okay, but I don't have anything concrete to tell you for the moment. I can tell you that in Belgium there will be. Uh, a big manifestation we want to organize not with the European news movement, but with healthcare workers into what we call Santé en Lutte. So we are working on it to get as much as possible as organization, as trade unions, but also professionals of the hospitals and first line to get to this manifestation and to show to the politicians that we we won't we won't uh, forget it's not because there will be summer now that we that we, we will forget and they, they they have to work on refinancing and structuring in an other way the healthcare in Belgium and also that the healthcare in Belgium is centered on, on the hospitals and not enough on the first line and this is also uh, something we have to address on our Belgium level is to develop better the first line. Thank so you, expect, very, very expect, also. Yeah. expect on the 13th September, a big manifestation in Brussels. That's great. <laughs> okay, thank you, Veronique. Vittorio, you, you already shared something about uh, What's, what's going on in Italy? How do you see it? I mean, is it, is it a promising time for a revival of health movements or what can we expect? Uh, it's difficult to say because uh, now there is a, a lot of uh, suffering in Italy and a lot of people is crying uh, is dead. But I think that it will be possible to organize a strong movement. 
for example, the government uh, had, uh, had to uh, give uh, a, in the last week a lot of uh, money, not only for hospital, but uh, for uh, medical uh, laboratory and laboratory on the territory, in the different uh, city and uh, village. And the government uh, has a, a, a discussion inside the public and private system. You must think that until four, four months ago, everybody, every media in Italy spoke about the example of the health system in Lombardy. The health system in Lombardy was uh, like an excellent, if you need a trial, if you need a cure and so on, you must go to the, the Lombardy. So now there is a shock. How was it possible in the most richest, in the, the richest region in Italy, in the region, in more European region in Italy, this uh, dramatic situation? So I believe that a lot of people is uh, thinking that is necessary completely to change the organize on the health system. I am not sure that we will arrive in a referendum to change the law and to put outside the private uh, system. I am not uh, sure that we will have the strong to arrive uh, to referendum, but probably we will be able to uh, have uh, a million of signatures in favor of uh, to change uh, this dramatic situation. Thank you very much, Vittorio, and, and thank you everybody. As we come to, to a closure, um, I really want to thank all the people who intervened. And uh, before I, I will give the word to, to Oriol for the final final remarks and uh, also way forward. Um, I just want to say the key messages that I think I captured from this webinar. So we want definitely uh, more public. We want a public healthcare system and we want a public that is in, in our control, in public control. We don't want a public that with our money uh, subsidizes or finances uh, the private system and the private profit. We want more primary health care. We want reorganized and strengthened uh, territorial system, community-based assistance. Uh, we, we need investment in that. We need training in that direction. We want more staff um, and, and, and better working conditions. And the two are related because when you're, when you're alone or you know, you're not enough, you don't work well. And, uh, and also because people need, need to be safe when they do the, their care work also because they, be, they become a danger for others. Um, we need to rethink our fiscal system in order to finance all this. We need to, 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 to tax who, who need to be taxed, who, who makes the profit in order to subsidize our public system. And we want a role for the EU, uh, but, uh, but it, it is critical, it is attention. It, it depends on, on whether we have the strength to, to, to make our voice heard and to influence EU decision in the favor of people's health and not uh, of few people's profits. Um, I think we have clear directions also for organizing our struggle. It seems like things in countries are happening. Uh, things in Europe have been happening and we need to continue even stronger in that direction. And uh, I think many of us will, will keep on seeing each other in uh, the activist spaces in order to organize our struggle. Uh, so thanks everybody, particularly to the speakers. Thanks for the participants. Sorry if not, not all the questions were answered, but again, we can continue the debate through all the other platforms that we, we animate on a daily basis. Uh, Oriol, uh, now to you for uh, the closure. Thanks. Oh, thanks hey. a, a lot to the visual, the visual presentation was, was awesome. Yes. Uh... Thank you, Chiara. And uh, yeah, just as you said, uh, thank you for your wonderful facilitation also. Uh, it's been very interesting also like that, uh, the way you were able to grab all the um, conclusions. And um, just to mention that uh, thank you, uh, Vittorio, thank you, Luca, thank you, Veronique, and thank you, Manuel, also. Uh, not only for your very valuable interventions, but also for your activism and your commitment. And thank you, everyone who was present uh, during this webinar. Um, and for your participation in the chats. I think that uh, all the interventions were very, very interesting. And um, as you know, as we said before, um, in a couple of days or three days, in some days, anyway, we will be sending you um, 
uh, a link for the for the video that was recorded of this webinar, which has been also uh, live on YouTube. Uh, but also we will be sending you uh, the two versions in English and in Spanish of uh, the fantastic work that Martin Toñola has been doing live. So thank you also, Martin, for doing this. Uh, you will be receiving that at home and uh, well, at home in your email, uh, but that's more or less the same. And uh, also, of course, thank you for the wonderful translation and the big effort uh, from Laia and um, David from Coinos Co Cooperative. So that's it from our side. Uh, thank you for being present. Just to remind, to remind that in the health rights action process, we will be we will keep uh, organizing spaces for social movements and international networks to meet, like this one, uh, because our goal is to strengthen the capacities for organized uh, civil societies to defend and implement the right uh, to health for all. So. In the next months, uh, we will be uh, organizing more webinars, communication campaigns, training opportunities like an international public uh, health university um, uh, where uh, activists from uh, all over the world can participate. So we, we hope that uh, during this time, we will be able to strengthen links and cooperation between uh, all of us who were here. So thank you very much. And uh, we can leave it here. Bye bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.